Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Mondays with Moshe. It is 9 o'clock, now just turned 9.01 p.m. here on the East Coast in New Jersey. And um, thank you for Techaya and Michelle and whoever else can turn on your videos. Of course, you know we love to have videos on so we can see people um, interact with them and get some nonverbal feedback. So thank you all for joining uh, tonight. I'm very excited to announce that we are joined by the one and only Dr. Ellie Liebowitz, who is a professor at Yale University. Did I get that right? Yep, so, that's right. Teaching at Yale. That, now, by the way, Yale is not Harvard. That's something else. Not to be confused with Harvard, okay? Uh, if you know, you know, as they say, right? So um, Dr. Liebowitz is the um, originator, creator of the space training or space method, um, which we don't know at this stage of tonight's show what that is. But what we do know is that it treats, um, I'm gonna say severe or acute anxiety, OCD, and some of those um, areas that uh, people uh, kind of get scared of treating sometimes because they're, they're too acute. So like we can all handle and deal with the uh, basic, simple uh, textbook anxiety that we learn about in school. But what happens when you have children um, whose anxieties and OCD symptoms are so acute and severe that they're really paralyzed. And I think that's hopefully what we'll be addressing tonight. Yes, is that about right? Sounds good to me. Okay, first you're hearing of it, huh? <laughs> okay, so Ali, do me a favor, do us a favor, tell us a little bit about your, you know, your degree, your credentials, um, how you landed a teaching job in Yale, and um, uh, what, what what your history in the field in the field is? Great. Okay. Well, first thanks for all, thanks for coming on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor, and I'm uh, really grateful to everybody who's joining. And glad for the opportunity to kind of uh, talk um, together about this. So, about me. Well, so I'm Ellie Leibowitz. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by training. I actually did all of my training in Israel, where I lived for many years. Um, so I got my undergraduate degree at Bar Ilan University, and then a master's and PhD at Tel Aviv University. I interned, and interned at uh, Schneider Children's Hospital and uh, was working in Israel uh, up until 2010. So what is that, like 13 years ago, um, when I moved to New Haven, where I am, uh, to take a job at Yale, where I started as a postdoctoral associate and have stayed on. I'm now uh, a professor here at the Child Study Center, which is part of the Yale School of Medicine. And together with another professor, I direct our anxiety and mood disorders program. So I guess that's like um, CV in a very small <laughs> nutshell. How did how did you fall into this um, treatment of children with acute anxiety? What, what's the history? Is there history to that? Was it was it always an area of interest, or was that something that you know your internship brought you to, or something like that? Well, it was actually always an area of interest, and I I sought out opportunities to really like build expertise and kind of deepen my knowledge in that area. So uh, even before internship at Schneider, I kind of, um, I volunteered there in the anxiety and OCD program there. Um, and um, it's it's kind of been a longstanding interest for, for me, anxiety, OCD related uh, conditions. Okay. Okay, great. So Let's talk a little bit about what space is. I guess, you know, I'm just thinking as an overview of treating children, we'd be remiss if we don't mention parents. You know, we call them children because they're little, but also because they're under the auspices typically of of parents or primary caregivers. Um, I think we, we we lose our title or our status of children when we're not under the auspices of um, some primary caregiver. So, uh I imagine that any model, you know, at this uh, today in this day and age has to, if we want to be effective, we have to include parents and parenting strategy 
into the treatment of children. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, but the history of involving parents in anxiety treatment, in particular in children, is actually a, a somewhat surprising one, I think, because uh, you know my work or, or space, it, it's definitely not the first attempt to involve parents. And there's actually like 30 years of research on this question of like, if we do work with parents instead of only working with a child, will we actually get better results? But you know what? And this is where it's, I think, uh, surprising. <laughs> Those 30 years of research actually didn't provide a positive answer to that. Uh, there's like two dozen clinical trials, which is a lot for this field. And these are studies that try to compare working only with a child to working with a child, but also with a parent. And they really didn't find a benefit to involving the parent, which is like a little surprising, maybe a little frustrating, given you know all of the effort that went into those uh, to those trials. But I think it sets up a really important question around how you should be working with parents. So we can agree that, yeah, sure, involving parents in some way probably makes good sense. But I think it's really important to figure out the the how of it. Like, what is the right way to, to involve these, uh, these parents? And the way that we work with parents is just really different from the approach that was like taken in, um, in the past, which you could summarize, and I'll, I'll let you talk again in a second, but uh, I think it would be fair to summarize the way people tried to involve parents in the past as mostly trying to train the parent as a kind of therapist for their child, like an amateur therapist. So, you know, maybe you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy with the child, and then you try to train the parent to also do CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy with the child as well, right? Like you're going to go home and get your kid to do exposures or try to correct some of their thought biases and think, you know, maybe teach them relaxation, practice it with them, things like that. But it turns out that that doesn't really seem to yield a lot of benefit over and above just like having a therapist do it for an hour and a week with the, with the child. And it also, it also kind of surfaces another challenge, which is that when you have a child who is maybe not that eager to engage with the therapy, they're usually not that eager to do it with their parent either. Oh. And trying to get that parent to go home, like do all those things with, the, with a kid who's maybe not really into it or is resisting it um, is a tremendous challenge. Sometimes actually leads in a kind of negative direction because maybe they start having arguments or conflict around it. And so, I think uh, I think the answer here is really to just take a really different approach to mm -hmm. the way that we work with parents. Okay, so so before we actually go into space, then I, I'd love to um, spend some time just just um, I guess reflecting and, and thinking about what you just shared. Um, I'm going to make a number of points, if that's okay, while my my mind still holds them, mm -hmm. well, it's held in that space, and um, and uh, you know I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, you know, one of the things you pointed out was we want to make the th the parent into a quasi therapist in terms of training them with um, the strategies that the therapist himself might use uh, when working with the child. And then, of course, that puts, like you said, the the, the um, treatment at risk. If the child would be resisting treatment in the therapy room, then he or she will likely potentially resist treatment at home also. And I want to make a number of points of that. Number one, you know, in that sense, there can often be a, an actual advantage to doing it in the therapy room in which if the, the therapist who is presumably um, mindful or trained in a stronger form of attachment than the parents might be, they may be lacking in their attachment style. Um, and, the, the, you know, coupled with the idea that, that um, this is an unbiased outside person who doesn't have the history with the child, the history of tension, the history of resistance with the child. So there could be a benefit in that sense. But where, I guess where I would 
question what you're saying and and you know what surprises me about the results of the studies are uh what if you know i look i see things through a very attachment focused lens and so if we could if we could increase the attachment skills and build and increase the attachment styles and attachment skills that parents have with children then even without using a specific modality or treatment of anxiety from parent to child meaning even if we didn't train the parent in cognitive behavioral work or in let's say space or behavioral work um, but rather put put great emphasis on on the attachment wouldn't that in and of itself help to treat some of the anxieties and i would you know take that argument even a step further and say uh, how often are neurotic symptoms in children really stemming from uh, attachment challenges so a uh, lack of feeling safe um lack of feeling nurtured lack of lack of feeling important or relevant or adequate and that creates all kinds of neurotic symptoms and so if we were to train or help parents again whether we train them just by training the parent or whether we do some kind of uh, work that that includes the parent and the child in some kind of family therapy or other modalities that are out there that work with parents and child children together, would we even need to uh, train them in being the child's therapist? So those are some of my thoughts on that. That's a lot, I know. Well, you know, I think what you're suggesting is plausible, but the truth of the matter is we don't know because that's not really what was tested um, to date, right? So. It's a it's an empirical question, right? I'm I'm an empirical researcher, and so I, I like to base my answers as much as possible on actual empirical data and evidence. And we don't have that evidence for the kind of approach that you are suggesting. Um, I think it is plausible that increasing a child's sense of security, um, improving the bond or relationship between uh, the child and parent may have a beneficial effect for a child who is anxious. In fact, space, which you know maybe we'll talk about in a little bit, is, is very much an attachment-informed approach to treating child anxiety. I think that will become, um, that will become clear, but we haven't really tested the approach of like, okay, let's just work on the attachment. Let's improve parents' maybe ability to kind of foster a positive, secure uh, sense of belonging in the child, things along those um, things along those lines. The other thing though that I do want to say is that uh, I, I think that in most cases where you have a child with really severe anxiety, while a lot of factors may play into it and you know relate to it, I think for most cases that probably actually is linked to a predisposition to anxiety itself, yeah. uh, to a, like a vulnerability in the anxiety system, whether that's you know threat detection or anxiety regulation, you know constructs that are really directly bearing on um on anxiety and i emphasize it in part because when we talk about work with parents i think it is also really important to distinguish between the ways in which parents may be helpful in helping a child to overcome an anxiety problem but distinguishing between that and the idea that uh, something about the parent is to blame for the child having the anxiety in the first place. I, I know that's not what you said, but I, I think it's really important to make the point in part because our field, you know, by which I mean just mental health yeah. writ large, you know, social work, psychiatry, psychology, et cetera. Our field has actually done a tremendous amount of damage over the years by advancing theories of child psychopathology that do blame parents. Uh, you know, if you go back, you get really influential theories like the schizophrenogenic mother causes schizophrenia in her child, and this, the refrigerator mother causes autism in her child, and, you know, things like that. And the truth is that empirical evidence does not back up those theories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think 
you know, it, it's just a really important distinction to to make because it's really easy to go from how can we help parents to like change something in order to help the child to get better. How, you know, it's a really easy jump from that to, well, parents must have, you know, messed up this child in the, um, in the first place. I don't think that the vast majority of child anxiety problems are caused by parenting of one style or another style. I really don't think there's any evidence to support that. In fact, I would say if your child is not predisposed to anxiety problems, you know, putting aside the really extreme horrible behavior like neglect and abuse and maltreatment, putting those things aside, uh -huh. there's not a lot that you're going to do that is going to give them an anxiety problem. You know, you might be a really uh, protective parent, a really controlling parent, for example. If your kid's not vulnerable to anxiety, you're not going to make them an anxious kid. You will make them a somewhat irritated kid, but <laughs> you're not going to make them an anxious child by by doing that. So I know it's not what you said, but I did want to add that also because this this line gets blurry very yeah. quickly. And I and I do think that there, that many people would have a lot to say about that. I, I don't think that everybody would agree, you know, with, fully with what you're saying. And I would say that that um, barring agree agreement or not, but I think we can both we probably both agree um, that a child with a predisposition to anxiety can be assisted. Uh, through an intuitive and um, properly attuned parent treatment. So uh, if if there's a child who has, let's just say, low-grade anxiety, so that we, we keep it simple, mm -hmm. a parent with uh, enough attunement might be able to encourage the child using, you know, encouragement, behavioral techniques, problem solving, um, and do that enough times that the child can build and develop confidence and mm -hmm. become less uh, anxious, let's just say, when it comes to being self-conscious or uh, not trusting in themselves. And so, and so however we cut it, there is, I would think that we would all agree that there's a contributing factor, if not that it's the parent's fault, but it become it can be the parent's contribution that can assist in getting a predisposed child over certain humps. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would say it like this. If, if your child is anxious, how you respond to that is going to matter. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like that is going to matter, but it's still meaningfully different from this child is anxious because of you being, okay. you know, this kind of parent, that kind of parent, et, et cetera. I think that is, to my mind, mm -hmm. sure, maybe not everyone will agree. I'm happy to yes. debate it with whoever disagrees. But, yes, and we're happy um, to take questions. For, the, for those of you who have, who have uh, any research or questions or um, uh, you know, points on this, please raise your hand by using the reactions tab on the bottom right of the screen, of your screen. Click reactions, click raise your hand, and we'll take your questions or comments. Um, you're, 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 you're okay. Um, I also want to just remind everybody that this show is sponsored by okclarity.com. Take a look at okclarity.com um, where you might find a platform for, to be able to promote yourself um, which I know many of us hate doing as mental health professionals, humble mental health professionals don't enjoy uh, promoting ourselves. And OK Clarity is a platform that will do it for you. So take a peek at okclarity.com and see what they can do for you. Um, OK, Ellie, let's talk a little bit about space. What is the space method? What did you discover um, uh, to innovate this and tell us a little bit about how it works? Sure. Um, with with pleasure. Um, you know, let me go back and tell you a story from from actually I mentioned that I was working in in uh, Schneider Hospital many years ago, and this actually goes back to to then. And at that time, we're talking like many years ago now. I was actually working in two programs at the same time. Um, one of them was the Anxiety Disorders Program, which was essentially a CBT uh, clinic for anxiety and OCD. But I was also working at the same time in a parent guidance um, clinic for parents of youth with really severe behavior problems. Uh, so, you know, kind of extreme externalizing problems. And there we worked with parents, you know, kids uh, with really severe conduct, the sort of things like that, they're often not um, 
ideal candidates for therapy themselves, let's say. And so there we worked with, with parents. And one of my jobs in the anxiety program was actually to screen um, new families who were like new referrals and try to see whether they were a fit for the program. And I just got into the habit of always asking, you know, does your kid want help? Because if you're trying to do cognitive behavioral therapy, you really need a motivated child. And so if parents said, well, no, my kid doesn't think they have a problem or they don't want to talk to anyone, they don't want to help, then I would usually say, you know, like, that's probably not going to be a great fit. And, you know, I had a whole spiel for uh, how I'm going to sort of let them down gently. But I did get increasingly frustrated because on the same day, I might be having that conversation with the parent of a child uh, with anxiety and telling them, well, we can't really help you if your kid doesn't want help. But then I walk down the hall. Now I'm in the parent guidance clinic and I'm saying to the parent, we don't need your kid to come in. We're going to give you tools. We're going to work with you. And, um, you know, we're going to be successful without your child ever directly attending. And so you can see how that kind of grew increasingly frustrating and did lead me to think a lot about um, working with parents in the internalizing, in the anxiety world. Now, you know, I said before that previous attempts to work with parents of anxious children focused on that, like, let's train you to do CBT to your child model. Mm -hmm. But there is something missing in that um, approach. Because if you think about it, that it's as though you're treating the parent like a random person who happens to spend a lot of time with this with this child or near this child. And so, hey, you're you're, you're there a lot. Let's teach you to do CBT to this kid. And you know, maybe that'll be um, helpful. But the thing is that parents are not just a random person who happens to be around the child. They have a much more special role. And when it comes to anxiety in particular, they have an even more meaningful role. Because, you know, if you're the parent of a child with any problem, obviously that is going to impact you in some ways. And like you have a responsibility there and things like that. But when it comes to anxiety, actually, parents play a more special role. Because children, by their very nature, respond to fear by looking to parents. This is part of the attachment system, right? Like, when you go back to uh, Harlow's experiments in monkeys, right? Like classic attachment kind of research. When Harlow wanted to see who was this monkey attached to, what did he do? He scared the monkey. Kind of cruel, but that's what he did. He would scare the little monkey and then it would, it would, he would see like, who does the monkey turn to? Well, that's their attachment figure. Okay. Meaning children are by nature hardwired, literally hardwired, because like we can see this in brain circuitry, but hardwired to respond to fear by orienting toward caregivers, by looking to them, by relying on them. It's part of like all mammals' basic uh, biology because we're born not really able to defend ourselves. And so when we're threatened as kids, what do we do? We look to parents. And parents are likewise really uh, predisposed and I'd say even powerfully motivated to detect when their child is anxious and to respond to that by providing protection and also by providing you know, regulation, soothing, reassurance, comfort, etc. That means that if you have a child with an anxiety disorder who is experiencing chronic anxiety, chronic activation of that like anxious system, what you end up with is chronic activation of this interpersonal system that involves the parent and the child. And so when children are anxious, parents get drawn into that to a very large degree. And they get drawn in through a process that we call accommodation of anxiety, right? Like almost every parent of an anxious child, if you ask them, and this has been studied like really all over the world, but we know it from our own lived experience, right? If your child is anxious, you're going to make some changes in your own behavior to try to help them not be anxious. And those are the accommodations, right? If your child is um, socially anxious, maybe you're speaking in place of them because you know you, you want to help them get through that moment. 
They have separation anxiety. Maybe you're staying nearby, not going out, sleeping next to them at night, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe they have generalized anxiety and you're just answering like 10 million worried questions every day because you, they're so anxious. And what do they do? They come to you and they seek reassurance. And this process of accommodation is really important in the context of anxiety because what research shows is that, yeah, it's very common, but also it doesn't work. In, in fact, I imagine this per perpetuates the anxiety because exactly. I, learn, I learn that I'm dependent on mommy and um, that I can't assuage, my, my anxiety cannot be assuaged unless she's there to make me feel better. Exactly. That's, that's, that's hitting the nail on the head, right? Like that's exactly it. And, you know, as a child, there's something really nice about always having somebody to rescue you, but always feeling like you need to be rescued by somebody. That's a really vulnerable way to live and ends up perpetuating that, um, that anxiety. And so in space, we take a really different approach to working with parents. First of all, we don't focus at all on trying to change the child's behavior. I literally make a promise to parents in like their first session of space. I'll say to them, at no point in this treatment, am I going to ask you to make your kid do anything or to make your kid not do anything? That's not how this works. It all focuses on your behavior as the parent, which is actually something you can control. Not easily, maybe, but you can control it much more than you can control your child's behavior. And what we do is focus on two changes that we try to bring about in how parents are actually responding to their child's anxiety. One change is to be more supportive in response to your child's anxiety. And we have a very specific definition for like what is a supportive response in space. A supportive response for us would mean anytime you're responding to your child's anxiety in a way that shows them both that you get it, that you accept it, you're not judging it, you're not like blaming them, you're not denying it, just basic acceptance of the fact that in fact, they are anxious in this moment. But it becomes supportive when you pair that acceptance with a message of confidence that your child can actually handle feeling anxious. So if you put those two things together, it can sound like saying to a child, I get it, this is really scary for you, and I know you can handle that feeling, for example, right? So we're, we have like the acceptance and the confidence. We'll train parents on those supportive responses because actually, Neither of those two ingredients, not the acceptance and not the confidence, neither one is actually all that common in how parents actually respond to their child. Like a lot of times we're not accepting, sometimes in, in kind of mild ways and sometimes in harsher ways, we're not really communicating that acceptance. Dismissing, um, dismissing or um, criticizing or um, you know, doubling down, things like that. Exactly, exactly. Maybe you're like being really demanding. Sometimes it's dismissive, sometimes, and sometimes it's actually denying it, right? Like, no, you're not anxious or it's not scary or things like that, even in a well-intentioned way, but it's not really accepting. And the confidence piece is really not that common either. In fact, a lot of anxious children grow up hearing themselves explicitly described by their parents as a child who cannot handle anxiety, which the parent isn't trying to be mean about it. They're just saying what they observe. Mm -hmm. But what the child is hearing is like, you can't handle anxiety. And so the first of those two big picture changes that we're trying to make is to help the parents to be more supportive. And we're, we'll work on that really systematically. But then the other focus of space is on the accommodation, on systematically, gradually reducing the accommodation. And so we'll work through a whole process. We'll identify what are the accommodations that you're making. We won't say just stop all of them overnight, but we'll pick one thing, right? Here's one accommodation. 
and we'll make a really detailed plan for what you're going to do differently in that specific context. We'll also work on how you're going to let your kid know about this change. We don't want to take them by surprise. And then we'll work through that plan to actually reduce the accommodation. And maybe not uh, surprisingly, space also includes tools to help parents to cope with how the child responds when you don't accommodate, because it turns out to nobody's surprise that when you start reducing an accommodation, children do not universally embrace you and thank you for your deep understanding of child anxiety. Right, right in general, I find that when, when you shift a, a dynamic and the, and the equilibrium is shaken, what the, the other party tends to do is to push harder because they're so accustomed to that equilibrium, it feels to them like they're falling off the cliff. So if I just yell louder and threaten louder, or complain louder or start to mm -hmm. say, you know, accuse, uh, you, you don't care about me. You're not helping me. I can't do this. You hate me. You just want me to die. I'm going to kill myself. Right. So they're tr All just trying to re uh, reconquer that um, equilibrium that was there before. Exactly. Now you're saying it exactly right. And so we will work with parents on how you're going to handle a variety of different situations that you might um, encounter from the child who's just like nagging you into insanity because you're not uh, accommodating and all the way to the child who might be getting really aggressive, even physically um, aggressive toward you or, or something or somebody else. or, or that, That's actually what well, I'm curious about. And, uh, those two last things, I'm really curious about the physical aggression because that's, that's a complaint that um, parents bring all the time to when we try to create these dynamic shifts, you know, in the in the system, whether it's the parent child or the family, the broader family system, but parents will come and say, um, what am I supposed to do when my child is getting aggressive with his siblings or he's breaking, you know, destroying property? I can't, they'll say, I can't, not that they can't, but they'll say, I can't let this continue where I can't um, put my other children at the mercy of my aggressive child. So what is a common response or an effective response to that? No, it's a really fair question, right? Like, because it can happen and you have to go into this, like prepared for, for that. We're not naive about how children might be responding. We do want to start out though, by helping the parent to just like even before like the, what are you going to do about it? Just understand it Conceptual, a little bit right? because you can be better regulated yourself if you can understand it a little bit more. For example, understanding that that behavior is an anxious behavior, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I, I talk to people all, all the time and uh, everybody that I meet knows the phrase fight or flight. Right. Like I never I don't know when I last introduced somebody to the phrase fight or flight. Like it's been a really long time. I can tell you that. And yet very often people forget that half of that is fight, that our fight or flight system, our anxiety system primes us for aggression. And so understanding that what you're seeing is an anxious response can already help to just lower your anger level a little bit so that you're less impulsive, so that you're less retaliatory. You know, I'll say uh, sometimes by way of, by, like as a metaphor, I'll say, if I were to come to you and tell you, you know that urge that you have to breathe air in and out all day? Well, I talked to a doctor and it turns out you don't need to breathe air. I know you think you do, but it turns out you don't. And so I'm turning off your air supply you would respond with rage, right? Like you would do everything in your power. Look, right. Right, like boom, you'd go to 100 in, in a millisecond because like, wait, <laughs> you're turning off my air supply. And obviously we're not doing something that's genuinely harmful to, to kids, but the experience for the child can feel a little bit similar, right? I can feel like you're turning off my air supply. So we want to start out by being a little bit empathetic to it. We also want to train parents on like, let's figure out what is... What is something you can actually safely ignore? And what is something that crosses that line to like, it doesn't make sense to ignore it. And for the things that are ignorable, I would actually encourage parents to ignore, mm -hmm. to not get drawn into that dynamic. Like your kid is yelling, you don't actually need to do anything. Mm -hmm. You're slamming the door, you know, like you don't actually need to do anything about it. That's them being anxious right now, they'll calm down, it's okay. But, for the behaviors that really are 
um, you know, less ignorable, that are more problematic, more severe than that. I divide the thinking around it into like three phases, with the first phase being the before it happens, where I want to work with you on how we're going to prevent it from happening. I want to train the parent to recognize the signs that your child is heating up and to learn to disengage from that interaction before you reach the like really, really, really severe behavior. Um, one other tool that is actually really helpful in that context and we use a lot in space is the presence of other people. If you're going to reduce this accommodation for the first time this week and you think your kid is a kid who may respond really aggressively, maybe don't be alone with them that first time or two. Have somebody else around, have an uncle, have a grandparent, have a neighbor, a friend, just having another person in the house or in the room or whatever actually will like reduce by a lot the chances of the most extreme behaviors. Mm -hmm. If we didn't succeed at prevention and the behavior is happening, that's phase two for me. It's like when it's happening. And at that moment, I just want the parent to do the bare minimum for actual safety and to disengage as soon as possible. So if that kid is like attacking a sibling, I would say remove the sibling from the situation. And maybe that's not fair because the sibling isn't the one who like did anything wrong. And I would agree it's not so fair, but my focus here is not really around like- broader, the On the broader picture. picture. Yeah, my focus is on what is the minimum I can do for like actual safety and then disengage. And only later when you're calm and the child has calmed down, that's where I will start to bring in tools where my goal is to prevent it from happening again. Right, like not in the moment. Right, a lot of parents, when something really bad is happening, they're really driven powerfully by the urge to like make sure this never happens again. But that leads them to escalate it more, to make it actually worse. Right, like they'll get in the kid's face and pick up their finger, and like don't ever do that again. They're yelling, they're hitting. Uh, only when you're calm and the child is calmer, that's when I would say, okay, what can we do that will make it less likely to recur? But I hear also one of the tools that we use is again, other people. Have a few people from your family or like your like life, you know, your, 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 your community, reach out to a kid and say, I know you're going through a hard thing. I know you're dealing with some difficult things. I also know you hit your man yesterday. That's really serious. That's physical violence. And it's never okay, even when you're really upset. Maybe next time, give me a call. Uh, maybe there's something I can do to help. That message creates a form of public opinion. It means that the aggression is happening not in complete privacy or secrecy. And that tends to inhibit those behaviors very powerfully okay. without getting into a dynamic of like punishments okay. or like, what am I taking away or what am I doing to you in return or things like that. So those are examples of like the way that we'll approach some of these like really tricky situations. Excellent. Excellent. Is, is there ever a line, you know, that, that we say it's too much for a child to handle? I know I'm go sort of going against the method for a moment just to learn whether there's ever a child whose dysregulation is so severe or um, their inability to cope is so severe that we can't apply the method. Or is that is that the child specifically who needs the method? Because I, I could think of, you know, clients, I worked with children for about 10 years and I did a lot of crisis intervention and we've, we had children who were so incredibly dysregulated um, uh, that they literally, you know, tore the house apart and would stay up the whole night and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we're later diagnosed with bipolar disorder, who knows, but is there ever, is there ever a time where we say this, this kid needs something else? Or again, is this the kid specifically who needs a space method? Uh, there can be, but I I think a, a lot of times the other the, the the latter part of what you said is also true, where that kid actually may need this even more than another child. But it's also important to bear in mind that we're not um, we, we're not going cold turkey, right? Like we're not doing um, like 
just complete removal of accommodation yeah. all, all at once. We can take a very small step and build some confidence in the parent and also in the child themselves that they're able to handle some of these uh, changes. So your first step may be not just focused on one specific accommodation, but even that accommodation, just reducing it 10%, yeah. right? It doesn't necessarily have to be taking a huge step all at once. When I'm working with a parent and I'm looking for like, okay, what should we start with? What should be that first step? What I'm looking for is something that will be meaningful, right? It, it will be- It'll feel the pinch. Yeah, it'll be meaningful, but also something that these parents feel like, yeah, we can actually handle that, right? Like we can, mm -hmm. we can really do that. And if that means starting really small, I think that is okay because- some of the confidence will actually come from the doing, not just like all the explanations that we can give, but actually living it and seeing your child like, yeah, they were really upset and then they got over it and they're okay. And like, they fell asleep at some point and the sun still rose the next day. And like that actually builds a little bit more confidence. And so sometimes it's about finding, like modulating and finding the right step rather than is this child like too sick? That being said, yeah, you do have to consider the overall like clinical presentation. You have to like I, I would never start treatment without like a good assessment. I want to know you know if this child is suffering from other forms of psychopathology. If they're violent. If they're actually violent. Uh, yeah, and also to find out you know. Yeah, you want you want to have a good picture. Like for any treatment, I think you want to have like good assessment before you jump into like okay, here's what we're actually going to do. Okay, I, I also just would comment on you know, the, the situation with sibling aggression, which is a very, very great um, area of contention for many parents. How can I do it if the other kids are going to get hurt? Uh, one thing I would just say about that is it's really, really, really important. I, I, I always emphasize this when I give parenting classes. It's really, really, really important to focus on validating and spending time with the with the child who's getting aggressive. You know, because because that kid is not going through a pretty time, their sibling is struggling, and um, and, and they're at their mercy. So it's it's important, you know, not just to remove the child from the room, but then also to give them the time, <clears throat> the time and space to be able to talk it out, to be able to share their anxiety, to be able to share their fears of that sibling, and you know, for their mental health and, and emotional well being. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one thing. And and another comment I would make, and again, um, everybody who's on the call, please share you know share your comments and questions we'll 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 go to leah who put something in the chat box in a moment but um to what i find sometimes to be helpful is preempting with a sort of paradox so uh, before we're gonna before we start an intervention with the child to be able to say to the child you know something's gonna happen soon or now that we're gonna do that's gonna be that's gonna make you really 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 upset and we won't be surprised if you, you know, have an outburst or an explosion or beat somebody up or feel like you want to tear the house down. And I find that sometimes to be sometimes it can be triggering for the kid and provoke provocative, but other times it's actually calming because when you set the child up by telling them, well, the the uh, intervention we're about to do warrants based on your history, based on the way we understand you, based on your anxieties, we expect you to really, uh, like we said in the olden days, have a cow. Right. And and uh, uh, react really strongly. Sometimes that sort of, uh, you know, gives the child a chance to do a double take and say, wait a minute, must I react in the way my parents are expecting me to react or I don't have to do what they're saying. So sometimes preempting uh, the experience for the child sort of gives them that validation. OK, they get that. That's how I have to respond. And that calms them down. So just another another little point here. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. In fact, I. I... There's only so much uh, like detail that I can get into in in like a uh, uh, calling. Actually, maybe it's a good moment to say people who really want to get trained in the treatment. Um, there's a website which is spacetreatment.net, spacetreatment.net, and there's a lot of resources on the website to learn more about it. In and um, there's also like a, you can put in your email if you're interested in being trained in in space. We hold training workshops fairly frequently, and uh, you know you can kind of sign up for for those. There's also a book whether if you're a therapist or or a parent of a child with um, anxiety. There's a book that really walks through the steps of doing space in a lot of uh, detail, and it's called Breaking Free of Child Anxiety and OCD. 
So you can find that um, that as well. Uh, if 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 I'm permitted the uh, self plug because I did write the book, but you don't get rich writing child anxiety books. So I don't feel too um, I don't feel too guilty. <laughs> mentioning, Bummer. Mentioning I was about that. to I was about to write one. Okay, well we'll have to find a different way to get rich. <laughs> um, okay, so again, any questions or comments, please. Uh, I, I want to ask you, can you give us um, anecdotally one or two example stories um, of some very, very severe cases? You know, I know the ones on, if, if you go to the website, um, I'm not sure which website it's on, if it's that the one that you said um, earlier, spacetreatment.net, or if it's on others where you have actual like YouTube videos of testimonials and you know things like that can you give us some anecdotes of some very severe circumstances that maybe maybe even to the point where you yourself became a little anxious and oh my gosh is this going to work or not or if not at least ones that the parents were very very anxious and dubious and then um the parents held it together pulled through and the child came around can you walk us through that yeah you know um we're talking about siblings, and it brings uh, it, it brings to my mind, uh, I guess, one one example from a family that I worked with, where there was a thirteen year old um, girl with uh, really intense OCD, and she was uh, what they used to call I don't know do they still call her or not, but uh, uh, like a tomboy. So not like stereotypically feminine. I don't know. Maybe that maybe tomboy is no longer uh, acceptable. Um, she was not uh, like like a, a girly kind of girl, and she had a form of OCD that, if you've never encountered it before, really sounds a little cuckoo, like a little psychotic, but actually is not so rare in OCD. So the people who really are familiar with OCD, it'll it'll like sound familiar too, but I warn for others that it sounds a little weird because it was a it was a contamination fear, but rather than being worried about contamination by like germs or things like that, she was worried about contamination from people. Like as though contact with a person could make her more like that person. Right. So if she saw something she didn't like, you know, like a treat, then that would be a trigger for her OCD. And she had a younger sister who was maybe six years old and was the opposite in being like the most girly girl um, imaginable, inevitably. And she was just horrified by this and had really intense, obsessive, compulsive symptoms around the idea of being contaminated by her younger sister's horrible, you know, girliness. Now, this led to a tremendous amount of accommodations in the family for both the parents and also for the sibling. So for the parents, just to give like one example, not only would they not wash their two daughters clothing together in the same load of the washing machine, they would actually run an empty load of the washing machine after the sister's clothes were in the wash and before they put the older sister's clothes nice. in the wash. Or at least they would promise that they did do that. I think there might have been a little bit of cheating, but <laughs> uh, you know, that it was really intense. And many other forms of like accommodation, like they couldn't drive in the car together, couldn't like so many things. And this really directly impacted the younger sister also, because ultimately what actually brought them into treatment was when the older sister came up with a new rule that said, not only are you not allowed to touch any of my things or sit on my designated furniture or go in my room or anything like that, but this younger sister is now no longer allowed to cross her older sister's field of vision. Like just... <laughs> So, so what that means is that is if, if this six-year-old, who by the way just wanted her older sister to like smile at her once in a while and like maybe play with her or something, but if she wants to get a glass of milk, she would chart a course through the house that ensured that her older sister didn't see her, which is like frankly kind of abusive at this point to the younger sibling. And this is like the starting point for um, for for treatment, but they were able to recognize that as hard as they were trying 
to follow all of the rules, right? To create this like mini world where nothing triggers this child's OCD, it wasn't getting better. In fact, it was obviously escalating. It was getting worse. And so they were willing to like take a breath and make a change. And they started out with just that focus on support. Like we're not even changing the accommodation yet at first, but when we see the child, like, you know, talking about the OCD, responding to it, like avoiding the thing, whatever, they would just make that supportive statement. They would just say something like, we get it. Your OCD is really strong. This makes you feel so scared or it's so horrible for you, which is something they actually had avoided doing in yeah, the past. Yeah. Right? Like it was hard for them to say, yeah, this sounds valid to, to us. They did. And also, we know you can handle those feelings. We know you're going to be okay. And then they took like a first step. Um, and the first step that they took actually goes back to the laundry where they said, okay, we're not going to be following this rule anymore. Now they knew this could lead to like a lot of problems. The kid is not going to wear the clothing. Maybe she'll She's not going to go to school. Way. Not going to go to school. Maybe she'll break the washing machine. Maybe she'll take it out on the on the sibling. But you know, they put on their flak jacket, they put on their helmet, and they wrote a letter to the child just explaining this is like, we don't think this is helping. We know it's so hard. We know the OCD is real. We don't think this is helping you. And so this is the change that we're making. The kid was, as you can imagine, like really um upset with them. The saving grace in this particular case was that she would not hit the sibling because she would never touch her. Because touching her was like so horrific to us. At least they knew she wasn't likely to actually physically touch her. And that was like one thing to have on the positive side. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they went through one, two days of a lot of chaos in the house. But at the end of that, the kids saw like, okay, this really isn't changing. Right. And actually went and did her own laundry for a few days, but then stopped. But then stopped doing that and started wearing the clothing that parents explicitly were saying, yeah, we're not uh, doing. It. And that was like step one. There were a lot of steps. Yeah, that and I think that's a key component. You know, again, if we could break through the pattern, then then the, the other person in the dynamic is forced to uh, create, you know, some neuropath of uh, acceptance and do something else, come up with a new strategy. So that... Uh Right. But the, but what 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 I think is really special here is that they were like we're saying the other person is forced, but they were able to do this whole process without ever saying to her, we expect you to. Right. Like they never said we expect you to wear this clothes or we expect you to get over this or we expect you to deal with that. They, they right. never said it wasn't that. a fight. It wasn't spiteful. It was just yeah. by process of elimination. She had to come up with something with an alternative. Exactly. And, you know, we look at, we've done clinical trials of space. There are multiple, like randomized controlled trials of space. They show really good efficacy. In fact, uh, there's a fairly large randomized controlled trial that compared space only with no direct work with the child at all to cognitive behavioral therapy with a child, directly with a therapist working with a child, and found complete non-inferiority for space, meaning it was just as effective as working uh, directly with the child. And of course, if you have a child who is not willing to do CBT directly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I would think that space would have a, a broader clientele. In other words, it, okay. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. There's a lot of children for various reasons who are just not candidates for direct therapy. Sometimes it's their insight or motivation or behavior, but sometimes it's also communication issues and other kinds of issues that can get in the way of successfully doing therapy with, uh, with a child. So I think it's just really useful to know that there's like another approach that is just as effective and doesn't rely on those things. But another thing that we looked at in the clinical trial is actually the parent-child relationship. And what we see is improvement in the parent-child relationship following treatment. And that's based on- Almost counterintuitively, right? Yeah, but it's I, it feels a little counterintuitive when you think about the stress of like doing this and maybe the child's angry. But actually, you know, the experience of having parents who really do validate, who really get it, and are actually able to help you to overcome this problem. Yeah, so this is, is, this is what I was going to say. Like, how many- parents are actually good candidates for this because anyone could learn something but what we've seen is that application you know from learning to applying is 
there's quite a gap, you know, depending on the parents, uh, uh, parents apostrophe, uh, um, ability to self-regulate or to co-regulate with each other. Um, how how often do you find that there are parents who cannot apply this? It happens. Uh, there is no therapy that is going to work for everybody, right? Like I, I, I'm not uh, quack enough to say space is going to work in every single case. Well, you're, of course, you'll never sell a book then. <laughs> exactly. There may be um, parents who really struggle, but I, on the other, uh, on the other end, I also tend to give the benefit of the doubt because there are a lot of parents where, like session one or your assessment, you think there is no way. There is no way that they're going to do this. They're not going to follow through or they're not going to do it or what have you. And actually, that proves to be wrong. And so I do give the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to work with the parent if they're willing to try. And sometimes it's baby steps. Sometimes it's a lot of education, like really uh, teaching them to understand that anxiety is not actually damaging and harmful for their child. There's, there, there are various challenges that can come up and we expect them to. But um, I'm I'm generally willing to say, if you're willing to try, I'm willing to try. Cool. Because sometimes the parents that you think like, wow, they're never going to do it, actually ends up being like a rock star and doing it really well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take a question from Leah. Hi, um, Dr. Leibowitz. Thank you so much for all of this. It's been incredible. I am a huge fan of the Breaking Free book. I've been... Um, I was introduced to it by Dr. Glenn Hirsch, who I work closely with, um, and I have seen such beautiful results. And I first wanted to raise my hand to share exactly the point that you just said, that I think the most um, beautiful moments for me are watching the um, relationship improve, because I've seen that countless times. Um, but my question is, if you have found effectiveness when only one parent is committed to treatment? Yeah, terrific question. Um, so first of all, thank you for your kind words. I really do um, I really do appreciate it. It is so gratifying when people actually find the work like useful or like I get an email from somebody and it's like, oh, I read the book or I did that. And it, it really is like humbling and gratifying. So I really do thank you for the, for your kind words. Now, in terms of one um, one parent, the short answer is yes. Uh, you can do space and be successful even when only one parent is committed to treatment. Now, let me expand just a little bit on that short um, answer and add a couple of like just a, a, a couple of points. One is, um, I will say, in our clinical trials of space, we purposely made the choice not to require that both parents um, actively participate. Because, well, we, we knew that it, requiring that would give a very biased sample of the population. Not every you know, family is going to be like that. And we wanted to test in like more real world kind of context, what about if only one parent is um, participating? The other thing that I wanna say is that even within the only one parent is actively participating, you still get different scenarios. Right? Like one scenario is one parent is busy and so they're not as engaged, but but like they're on board and you know things like that. Uh, another is a parent who actually is just like, no, I'm not up for this, or even I I disagree with with this. Even in that situation, I am still willing to work with the one parent who does want to do it and can still have success. I will acknowledge that when you have one parent who is actively not on board like really again sure yeah it can be uh more difficult and so i do have some um tricks for how i try to mitigate some of those risks but uh but it uh, going back to like the short answer yeah you can do space even with one parent and and um and can still have efficacy in other words one parent's consistently making these kinds of changes in their behavior can have a really important impact on the child even when you have another parent who is not changing their behavior in this um, in this way. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's take a question from Michelle. Much, um, Dr. Lewis. I'm also a very big fan of your work and your book. I actually recommend it to 
almost all my clients that come on board. And also I found that it has been very helpful even when I, you know, if, if I don't have availability right away, I feel like it gives the parents the tools of something that they can get started and working on on their own. I think the book is really very clear and pretty self-explanatory. Um, my question for you is, I, I, I saw it in the chat also, I've, I've attempted to train in the space program in the past, but I've had difficulty accessing the training because it's always waitlisted and doesn't seem like there's availability. Is that going to change in the future or? Ah, um, well, thank you also <laughs> for, for the kind words. And well, it is true that the, the workshops tend to fill up very quickly. And I do a lot of them. We've been doing a workshop at least once a month for like the past three years or, or something like that. And uh, we have like 50 people in every workshop and they fill up right away. And so on the one hand, again, it is very gratifying to me to see the level of enthusiasm, but I do also realize how frustrating it is when people are trying to register and sometimes have tried like multiple mm -hmm. times and just not gotten in. Will it change? Um, well, I mean, I don't know how deep the uh, well of like high demand is. And so there's one level in which I can't really know, right? Like maybe this will taper off at some point, things like that. I am considering, but not yet doing uh, other forms of training, like, you know, more recorded things, online th things that don't like would be less um, constrained in, in terms of participation. But it's really important to me to maintain the efficacy and the fidelity of the treatment. And so it's a, it's a slow process and not something I'm just going to kind of rush into. I guess the last thing I'll say is if you have tried like twice to register and we're not able to, and you're trying again and you see it's all full, send me an email and tell me, okay. oh, you said on the call with Moshe that uh, I should email you <laughs> and I will try to get you a spot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I put my name on all the wait list and I hope no nobody else was out. listening. I hope nobody else was listening. Was <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, are these trainings for therapists or for parents also? These are for therapists. Mm -hmm. These are for therapists. That's another thing I'm kind of working on is like, okay, should we do something like just like for, you know, parents, but I'm really busy and, and uh, doing more things is, is always hard. Um, right now, these are for therapists. Excellent. Okay. Any, does anyone else have any questions or comments for Dr. Leibowitz? Okay, Tova, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I did have a question about the situation that sometimes happens where parents will say that they can't really identify where they are accommodating and it's more the child's behavior. Like for, I'll give an example, let's say in regards to school refusal. So the parents will say, um, you know, we're doing the best we can to get them to school. We're not, if, if they do go late, we're not making home an exciting place. They have to get up on time. They're responsible for their schoolwork. Um, and they're having a hard time figuring out where they're accommodating in this situation and rather feel like this is a behavior that the child is, you know, exhibiting and we have to deal with their behavior with them. Um, so yeah, just wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple of things here. One is it, it's really important to kind of work through a process of mapping out these accommodations in a systematic way, because in my experience, or I should say in our experience, even parents who start out by saying, we're not really accommodating, when you actually work through like systematically mapping it in the way that we kind of lay out, um, you do find that parents are accommodating. And so it, it's really important to work through that before you kind of settle on, like, I guess there isn't much accommodation that's occurring here. That's number one. Number two is the, even in a scenario where parents are truly not accommodating, the work on support can still be um, very impactful. But the third thing I want to say is that for really serious school refusal, and just to be clear, like when I say really serious school refusal, what I'm talking about is the kid who's not going to school, not the kid who is like missing days occasionally or late or too much time in the nurse's office, but like the kid who's like really not going to school for, for like a while. Uh, in that situation, I think that a typical course of space in like the classic, like the way it's typically done 
is probably not going to be effective enough. That is my, um, that's my guess. I, I would say the same, by the way, for other, like pretty much other therapies too, like a typical course of CBT in that scenario is unlikely to be efficient enough. It, parents who want to know how I do approach really serious school refusal should watch a brief video that I recorded on the topic. You can find it on YouTube. If you search for like space and my name, Ellie Leibowitz, you'll see a YouTube channel with like a few videos. And one of them is on what I called entrenched school refusal. And it does lay out a plan, I, I guess, for how I would approach really serious school refusal, because that is a very intractable situation. It's a very stubborn situation and requires a lot of energy in order to create some momentum in in a really stuck situation. Mm -hmm. Right. I was wondering yeah. about, you know, things that kids don't do. It's 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 a different uh, beast, I would imagine. Right. Yeah. And but it, that's true. And our, our focus, again, it's never going to be on you have to do. But even like most things, putting aside the, the entrenched school refusal, most things that kids don't do are accompanied by a parent, yes, doing something. And so you can you can often still intervene in the more typical right. way. But yeah, but look at the school refusal video if it's relevant to you, because I think you'll like, maybe it'll be useful. Thank you. Let's take a question from Shashi. Go ahead, Shashi. Yeah, hi. Um, is there an age, age limit that... Um, you treat because I could think of some almost adult children. I'm thinking specifically of an 18 or 19 year old that, in his maturity and the behaviors, is more like a six year old that's having tantrums. Um, would would you be able to use this method with adults who are living at home? Were you experiencing the same experiences? Terrific question. Um, so first of all, is there an age limit? Uh, not really. The the kind of typical like use of space is generally in school age, so up through like 17 or 18. There's one, one of the clinical trials that's published actually goes all the way to age 18 um, with good um, with good results. But uh, I want to add that there's actually a version of space and adaptation. There are a number of adaptations that we've made to space for more specific situations, uh, or like beyond just anxiety and OCD and in, in kids. And one of those adaptations actually focuses specifically on adult children, and in particular on adult children with what is sometimes called failure to launch, meaning mm -hmm. an adult child who is not functioning as an mm -hmm. adult not going to right. school or college or work or whatever. They're stuck at home, living with the parents, often mm -hmm. endlessly, like really long time. And um, we have adapted space for that situation. We actually just uh, published a, or are publishing a clinical trial of that um, as, as well. And um, we also offer training on that, but only to people who have already done the regular training because it builds on it very, um, very, closely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there isn't really an age limit in that sense. I Going back to like more like just anxiety, not the failure to launch per se, I guess I would say it, it can be very applicable all through adolescence. Probably the, num the percentage of children who are like 10 for whom this is the optimal treatment is a little bit bigger than the percentage of children who are 17 for mm -hmm. whom this is the optimal treatment. But for those kids who are 17 and it does fit, they are the ones who really, really need it. Very, right, very right. That way I asked, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. As a last, the last shot. Thank you so much. Right. That's what I felt. Wow. That's wonderful to know. Wonderful to know. Thank you so much for such holy work. Thank oh. you. One one last question, Dr. Lee, was before we conclude. Selective mutism. This is a question that was lingering in the back of my mind. And I see somebody else asked it, so I'm going to throw it at you. Uh, can this be applied at all to selective mutism? Yeah, it can. The uh, I mean, selective mutism is almost inevitably accommodated. It, yeah. It's very hard to have selective mutism without a healthy dose of accommodation by parents, also by others, right? Like peers and you know, teachers, etc. Um, and so, 
it, it can. We have used space in um, many cases with selective mutism. What we do, what we have not done uh, is a clinical trial of space for selective mutism. Again, I'm a clinical scientist. I like to say like, here's the data. We, we don't have a clinical trial of it. So I can't say that, but I can say we have done it many times with, uh, with good outcomes. So what, what would be the treatment? I mean, is it just removing accommodations? Essentially, yeah, I, it doesn't it doesn't have to be the case that space is the only thing you do, right? right. Like the wow. space is going to stay space. So it's going to be working on support and working on accommodation, but it could be part of a broader treatment strategy that also includes other, um, you know, other active ingredients. That's true in anxiety also. If you're doing space, it doesn't mean that you can't be doing CBT with a child, for example. It's, it's common to actually be doing both. There is a clinical trial not yet done, but starting of looking at combined space and mm -hmm. um, and CBT. But even without the study, I can say it is very possible to do both um, simultaneously. So in selective mutism, it may be that if a child is amenable to other treatment like components, it may make sense to have some of those as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, th I want to thank you, Dr. Leibowitz, for joining us and sharing um, and sharing some of these resources. And um, I found this to be quite enlightening and um, not even so complicated, you know, not something that's necessarily so complicated, but something that certainly entails consistency, buy-in, right? There has to be buy-in and consistency. Um, and then I guess some thick skin to be able to apply. So thank you for sharing this and for sharing this with our group of 1500 mental health professionals and for the 40 or so who are, who are here live. And um, thanks for joining. Well, thank you so much for having me on and thank you everybody for some uh, like your attention and, and also some really excellent uh, questions. Thank you very much. Good night. Good